So we're in this one word series. It's a two week series. And at the end of the, the time we worship together today, I'm hoping that you have a word um, from God that, that uh, you um, are excited about uh, journeying with him on and that we want to dedicate it to him this morning by um, we have some paper up here and some Sharpies by basically writing it down and uh, kind of handing it to God saying, God, this is your word for me. And I want you to do this out, work this out in my life. Um, Part of, or if not the major piece of being a follower of Jesus Christ, like, like prob- the thing about discipleship, you may have heard that word discipleship, is this, this word that comes with discipleship, this, this word that comes with following Jesus Christ, this word that comes e- even with like knowing him, it's, it's this word that we don't like, it's this word called change. You, you can't do discipleship without change. You can't, you can't walk with Jesus Christ without change. You, you, can't, you can't even really know who God is without some aspect of change. Change is part of, of what God wants to do in our life. In fact, I, I think if you look back, hopefully you've seen how he has changed you. And I'm, you know, we're praying in 2020 that he will continue to work it out in your life, that he'll continue to change it. There's verse after verse I could use. Um, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. He started something and he's still working. Um, there, there's, he has knit you together in your, in your, your parents, in your mother's womb, and he's, he's, he's working things out. He's, he's, he's doing change in your life. But here, here's the problem with change. Change is difficult. Change is Hard. Change is scary. Change is painful. The, in fact, have you ever noticed? Little, little changes are hard enough, but the bigger the change, the harder it gets. You know, you, you, you change jobs and you have to move out of the area, how hard it gets. The, and, and I don't think God is doing micro changes in our life. He is, but he really is about life transformation, a total change. In fact, he says, you're a new creation. He's, he started something new in you. He wants to create a new heart in you. And so we do this one word because we want to partner with God and say, God, how do you want to change this? We, you, you ever think that if he, he changed all of us all at once, how painful that would be? Like if he said, I want you to learn all of, of what I want you to be, all at once. He, he, he gives us time. He, he says, I want to work this out in you. I, I, want you to, I want to change over time. So we, we have up on front of the stage, I don't know if you can read them or not, all these words that we've had during the, throughout the years. We've had a whole lot more. These are just a sample of them. Um, and there's some great words. And, I, and I'm hoping that you have a word this morning that you're coming in with, or I hope that one's given to you. But we got like path and wisdom, grace, love. Prayer, dream. Over on this side, we have uh, simplify or go, um, confident, uh, peace, contentment. A lot, a lot of great words, and there's a lot of powerful words in Scripture. I want you to look on the screen here, though, because I was, I was thinking this way. It's like, all right, is there a bad word? Like, th- not swear words. I'm talking about, is there a word that we probably, and I was looking at the screen a little while ago, and I was looking at this word over here, milk. I was trying to figure out how milk ties into one word. And what was the, there's another one that my daughter said, repulsive. I, I guess you could figure out a way to tie those in, but uh, um, it's, it's a little tougher. But, but God's, God's going to do something in your life. If you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 8. You ever hear this phrase um, as you're turning there um, in your life, one thing leads to another? You, you ever ex- experience that? And let me, let me explain it quickly to you. So my wife had this great idea. Instead of having a vacation, um, we should get a pool, which sounds good because pools, are, you know, they're, they're expensive, but they're doable. But one thing leads to another. You know how that plays out, right? Well, if I get a pool, that means that I have to do electric around the pool, all right, so you understand what that means for me as a money person, like dollar signs. Oh, so we bring in the electrician in and says, oh, by the way, you don't have space in your electric box for that. You're going to have to put a whole new electric box in for that. Here, here comes the, the, the one thing leads to another. And then I realized, and I, I probably knew this beforehand, that uh, I was probably going to be the one vacuuming, skimming, and putting the chemicals in for the most part. My wife does a lot of it too. But I know my kids weren't going to do much of that. Um, and, and not only dollar signs, but now we're talking about time. I don't, have, I don't know what, you, what sign you use for time, but, but now it's double. 
And, and all, one thing leads to another, closing it out. And, and, and especially in house projects, one thing leads to another. You start one thing. Like, this is going to be simple. Just, just a simple thing. We're just going to, you have this idea. Why don't, I, why don't we knock out a wall? This, this is my wife's favorite thing to say. This is a simple thing. All we, ha all we have to do is remove the wall. All it takes is a few tools. You're great. I'm great at demolition. I love demolition. It's fun. Just, just take out this wall and see what happens and see how it all works out. It's, it's going to be fine. And one thing leads to another. And so we tend, to, I'm thinking we're in one of these categories this morning. For some of you, you know that rule. One thing leads to another. And so all house projects, all house projects are not to be done because you don't know what you're getting into. I don't want to paint. I might run into something. I, I, I don't want to strip wallpaper. I don't know how many layers there are. I don't, I don't want to vacuum. I don't know what I'll find. I don't, know what, I don't want to dust. There's probably stuff underneath there. I don't want to be, because that one thing leads to another. So you kind of like, I'm not, I, you have a list of projects, but you're not going to do them. You've had, you had projects on your list for 10 years now, and they're still not done, and you still haven't started them because one thing leads to another. Some of you are perfectionists. And so like, you start a project, and that term, one thing leads to another, means that you're still working on the project, trying to get it done, and it's been, te it's been 10 years in the, work, in the making. You know, because you have to have the walls perfectly sanded. Like, you can't, you can't it's, what do they say? If it has to feel like a baby's, baby's bottom. You know, it has to, you have to be, it's got to be perfect. And the tape, you can't see the tape. That's a, and then the molding, you have to make everything perfect. So you take forever doing a project. And then there's some of us that are like in between. We're like, good enough. Do you know what that means? Like, it's good enough. It's, it's fine. 80% of the, it's 80% done, so it's good enough. And some of you have spouses. So here's where the, the, where the fights come in, right? When you have a spouse who is 100%, like, it's got to be completely done. And then you have, you have one of you that's like, good enough. Now, why I lead into that is because there, there's a story about Jesus. It's the only story about Jesus, the only miracle about Jesus, where Jesus runs into this, like, little issue in the healing. Like, there's something that happens. Like, he gets halfway there, and something doesn't work. I mean, so let's get into the story a little bit. Um, Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 22. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. So, so what happens? The story. Jesus is going to Bethsaida, which is on the top of the Sea of Galilee. It's a fishing village. It's, it's, a, it's where some of the disciples had come from. It's where, where he said, come follow me. And so he goes to this village, this small little town. And while he's there, someone, some people bring someone who's blind to Jesus. And I just want to stop there for a second. Some, some of us have to realize or recognize that some of the great things that God has done in our life is not because of our faith, but because someone had faith enough to bring you someplace or to do something for you. Like sometimes the faith, of, uh, your faith has impact on somebody else. Sometimes God works powerfully in our faith in someone else's life. I, I think that's pretty amazing, pretty cool. That, that the blind man didn't, want to, didn't say he wanted to come. Someone else brought him. Says you need to be with Jesus. You, you, need to, you need to see who he is. He can change your life. He can transform what you're going through. The, his friend's faith changes his life forever. And, and again, this is not the point of the message, but it's a great little aspect of the message that your faith can have impact in somebody else's life. Your act of obedience can have impact in someone else's life. That God can heal spiritually people's lives through your faith. So he brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. They're like, Jesus, we have heard stories of how you heal. We have seen how you work. We believe that you're the Messiah. We believe that you can do this. 
And so they begged him to, to heal. And so Jesus, always doing things differently, he led the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. He's like, all right, I don't want to be around all these people. I don't need everyone watching me. I, I just want this to be between me and you. This is, not, this is not for the whole town to necessarily know about. I just want to do this between you, me, and the disciples. And so he, he takes him by the hand because the blind man can't, he can't see, so he's going to guide him outside the village. And, and then he does this strange thing. He spits in the man's eyes. I, I, ha, I was going to come up with something. I really don't have any idea really why Jesus would do that, but he does things the way he wants to do things. By the way, sometimes, here, here's, here maybe is the, the application, sometimes we look at what Jesus is doing in our life and we have no clue why, but it's, it's going to be a good thing. We, we don't, we just, sometimes we just don't understand. Sometimes we just don't get exactly why we're going through this right now and we may never understand it, but God, in his great storytelling way, does what he wants to do. And it's a beautiful way to tell his story. And someday... We'll be able to ask him, why did you spit in this guy's ear? Why did you do I? Why did you do this to me? Why, 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 God? He put his hands on him, and Jesus asked, Do you see anything? All right, so, so here, here, here's Jesus. All right. Every time he does something, all right, we get to the the, um, the wedding feast. You guys are familiar with the wedding feast? Uh, they're running short of wine, and he's like, Hey, fill those up. Best wine ever. You know, there's a lame guy coming in. Uh, he, he's, he's on his mat. He's like, get up and walk. No issues. Like, over and over again, we see Jesus healing. And it's like, he just has this way of, of speaking. And it, it happens. And all of a sudden, this one miracle, this one time, he like spits in the guy's eye, and he, he puts his hand on him, and it doesn't work. It partly works. It's halfway there. He moves from like blindness and what does it say? I see people, but they look like trees. It's a little, little blurry, Jesus. This is not quite the, the miracle. I, this is good. I can see now. I can see that people are moving around. I can see things waving. But, but, but somehow his power, I don't know if Jesus, maybe Jesus was having an off day. You know, maybe, maybe Jesus is like, got up that morning, had a little rough breakfast, and his indigestion was rising in him, and his spit was a little off, had a little too much food in it. I don't, how is it that Jesus, who never makes mistake, who, who never like halfway does anything, all of a sudden comes to this miracle and is like, huh. And do you ever notice how, if you read the Gospels, and I hope you read Scripture, how Jesus is the, like, he asks questions that he already knows the answers to. Like, you, you know that, right? Like, anytime he asks a question, he kind of knows the answer to. He, he asks questions for us and for his disciples. He's like, hey, Jesus know. by the way, Jesus knew what was happening. He, 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 there's a reason for this. We'll get to. And he asked the guy, hey, all right, now that I spit and now that I put my hands on you and now that I healed you, do you see anything? He's like, he wants everyone to know what's going on here. Oh, it's not completely healed. Let's try this again. And then the guy, what does it say? One more time, once more, once again, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. I love this, this, this verse. If you have your Bible, underline this. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Now let me just tell you why. Because Jesus is teaching his disciples something. Jesus wants his disciples to know that physical sight is one thing, but spiritual sight is a whole different thing. And that, that many of us are walking through our life like this blind man. We, we either don't see, or we see kind of in, in shapes and in like views, or we, some see clearly. He's like, oh, you're not seeing correctly. He's telling us, about, in this, this scripture, there, there's like four or five things that they're not seeing correctly. Jump, jump over to um, 8, verses, verse 14. He says, uh, the disciples had forgotten to bring bread. All right, so let me give you a little context. The story before, if you do the headings over scriptures, it says, Jesus fed the 4,000. All right, he just, and understand that he also fed the 5,000. So twice he does amazing miracles. He like feeds people. And not, here's the completeness of the miracle. Not only does he feed people, but he gives leftovers. 
Like he has basketfuls of leftovers. They have nothing to begin with, so for a few loaves and a few fish, and afterwards they're walking around with baskets. And so the disciples had forgotten bread, but in reality they've also forgotten who they're with, who always supplies their needs. But Jesus says this, he says, be careful, Jesus warned them, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and, the Sa- and, and of Herod. He says, watch out, for the, watch out for the teachings of, watch out for what they value, watch out for the, the, the things that, that are not good. In the, he's like, see this, all right? See, see how hypocrisy works out. See, he's looking at the Pharisees. See, when it comes to the Pharisees, it's always really the same discussion. He has a problem with their hypocrisy. That they want to be seen one way, but their hearts are far from him. That, like, they're like, uh, they worship, but they don't. They, they, they're generous, but they're not. That they do everything with a show. They, they, they want to be seen as spiritual. They, they wear nice clothes. They, they come worship every Sunday, and, and they're, they're, they're like walking through the motions. They see something, but they're not, they're missing something. He's telling the disciples, he's like, listen, don't be like them. See who you really are. See yourself clearly. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't be someone who wants to be seen one way, but who's living a whole different set of aspects. He says, watch out for them. So this is what happens. They discuss with one another, these are the disciples, it's because we have no bread. Do you get that? They're like, they, don't, they have no clue what's going on. They don't see. They're not understanding. They're not, they're not getting it. And so this is what Jesus says. Um, aware of their discussion, Jesus says, what are you, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see, here's the word, do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? He goes on to say, do you have eyes but fail to see and ears and fail to hear? Don't you remember when I broke the five loaves and the five thousand, uh, for the 5,000, how many basketfuls you picked up? They're like 12. We had 12, left, 12 baskets of leftovers. When I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets did you have left over? Seven. Do, do you still not see? Do you still not understand? They're not, they're not getting it. They're not, they're not seeing clearly what Jesus wants to do in their life. They're, 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 they can see, but they're blind. And, and I wonder, if we don't have a bunch of people in our world and really here this morning, like, or uh, me, walking, walking in one of those two aspects, like you don't see it all. You're not understanding what God's doing in your life. You don't understand that he's a God who provides. You don't see the, the, the hypocrisy in your you, you see, you see all the planks in everybody else's eye. You, you, know, you know, we're one of these people. Like, we're all, like, like you see all the issues. Man, they're, they're annoying. They're, they're frustrating. They're, they're lazy. They're, you see all the, the, the little sawdust. And everything, but the plank in your, you can't see yourself at all. Like, you're blind to the fact that you, you to whatever you're, you're struggling with. You just don't, you don't get how you relate to people, how, how, how broken it is. You, you're, you're not seeing. You're not seeing yourself correctly. You're not, you're looking at your situation. And you're like, man, I wish I had more money. I wish I had more of this. And Jesus says, don't you understand? Don't you see? I am. He's the provider. He, he has provided for you over and over and over again. You may not be where you want to be financially or with your house or where, wherever, but he's provided. He's taking care of it. And my guess is you still have leftovers. So you have like, for, coming out of Christmas, you have, you have whole rooms you have, okay, let me pay this. you have a garage that you don't park in, you have an attic that you don't go in, and you have a basement full of all filled with leftovers that you'll never use. And you're complaining about what you don't have, what we don't have. I don't have enough this. I don't, I, I need a new car. I need a new something. And, God, and he's like, don't you see? I provide. He's always, he's provided for you. He's taking care of you. Don't worry about that as much as just seeing the Messiah, seeing, seeing Jesus. Let me just give you the main one. The very next story, after Jesus heals the blind man, he asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? Let me put it in the words that we're using today. How do you see me? How do you see me? How do you see Jesus? How, how, who do you think he is? 
And so there, there are some that are blind to Jesus, maybe even this morning. There are some that have no clue who Jesus is and what he, can, what he wants to do in their life, right? They're, they're like, I don't care about Jesus. Jesus who? He probably didn't even ever exist. He, he's some figment of some imagination out there. You're, you're, the Bible would say that you might have a veil over your eyes. You, you might have one of those, uh, what are you, the sleep, those sleeping things that you, you, know, you kind of cover your eyes so you don't have to, I don't even know what they do. Your eyes should be closed anyway when you're sleeping, but you, you put it over your eyes. Yes, face mask, that's the word, thank you. Uh, fa a face mask, you know, you have a face mask to who Jesus is? And that there's, there's some people, that, then he says, there's some people who say he's Elijah, he's John the Baptist, he's Elijah, um, he's one of the prophets. Some of you would say, yeah, I, I know about Jesus, I, I know that he's, he's a spiritual guy, I know that he's a good teacher. You may even know all the stories about Jesus, you may know all the healings, you may be able to preach this 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 miracle better than I can. You may have all sorts of spiritual insight. You may know the Greek terminology to the words used in that passage. You may, you may know all sorts of details. You may have grown up in Sunday school and you've seen the flannel graphs and all the things that he's done on those things. You, you may have taught Sunday school and, and used the flannel graph. I don't know. You, and yet you're still missing the point. You're, you're, you're seeing like a, a version of Jesus, but you're not seeing your Messiah, your Savior, your transformer. You're the one, that, the one that wants to work in your life, the one who wants to be your savior, the one who wants, that, that's the most important thing that we could ever see is who is Jesus and what do we do with him? See, the, the problem is, again, Jesus and Mark are making a point. The, the, the half healing is not that Jesus didn't have enough spit in his mouth. The half healing is saying, we have a bunch of people in our world who either don't see or halfway see. And what he wants to bring is verse 23. I believe that he wants to open our eyes. He wants our sight to be restored. And he wants us to see clearly. Look over in verse uh, 34. Not, not only does he want us to see clearly, but I think some of us need to, to be able to see clearly what it means to follow him. We, we, we tend to, to make following Jesus, you know, if there's a job description, we, we kind of write our own job description for it sometimes. We, 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 kind of, we, we kind of create the story of what it means to follow Jesus. And, and, and you may have heard this in some places, you know, if you follow Jesus, you'll have prosperity. You know, you'll, health and wealth. You'll, you'll be taken care of. For, you'll, 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 your life will be easy. Your life will be good. You'll be perfect. It, your marriages will all work out if you follow Jesus. Your, your, your finances will all come into place if you follow Jesus. Your, your, your job situation, if you believe hard enough, you'll, you'll have the job of your dreams. And Jesus leans into his disciples after walking through who the Messiah is and how they need to trust him. He's like, let me just tell you what it means to follow me, what it means to change, what it means to be my disciple. This is what he says. Whoever wants to be my disciple, verse 34, must, must, you can underline that word, that's kind of a have to to me. It's like, this, this is kind of on the job description. This is, this is important. Must deny themselves, take up their crosses, cross, and follow me. Wait a second, Jesus. I thought you were about the health and wealth thing. You know, like, if I believe hard enough, it's all going to be good. This whole, deny myself, you know what that means? It means giving up what I want. What if I, what if I want something that you don't want? That's not going to work out for me. Well, take up my cross, take up my, my burden, take up the journey that you have for me, whether it's to death or to, um, to poverty or to struggle or to good, uh, whatever, whatever your plan for me is, take up my cross. I want to carry my own cross. You know, you know what I mean? I want, I, want to, I want to create what I want. I, actually, I, want, to, I, don't, I want to carry my flowers. I want, to, I want to carry my backpack full of the stuff that I have. And follow me. That is what he says. Verse, um, the next verse, verse 35. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. He, he has this kind of like, uh, two things that don't go together. 
right? In order to follow Jesus, this is what he says. In order to get what God wants to do in your life, you have to lay down everything that you want him to do in your life. If you, wanna, if you want him to do a lot in your life and you're hanging on to those things, you'll never get what God wants to do in your life. You either lay down and let, or you hang on and don't receive. You can't do both. You know, how, you know how difficult that is for me? You know how difficult that is for all of us? Like, we, we would love for us to be partnering with Jesus and say, all right, Jesus, let's get on the same page and let's want the same thing, which would be great, and, and we do at times. But there are times when he, we, we know that we need, to, we need to die ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. That's what discipleship is. Let me just read the, the, la, the other verse. It says, what good is it? This, this is for our, our environment, um, always chasing the next thing, you know, advertising, saying, hey, you'll be happy if you get this car, get this promotion. What good is it for a man if he gains the whole world? If you get, if you get everything in your dreams, or everything on your Christmas list, everything that you ever hoped for, you, if you get all of that, and yet you forfeit your soul, you, you walk away and you're still empty. You're still broken. You still have nothing. You have everything, but you have nothing. Or what can anyone give in exchange for the soul? See, I, I, the cool part about me being able to preach, all right, up here and then share the messages, I get to share with you my one word. And my one word this year was clarity. Seeing clear. I don't, listen, I don't know what that journey is going to be like. I don't know what change will happen because of clarity. But I know that, that this is the scripture in my book, in my notebook. Someplace I had that little notebook. I have two things in there. I have my one word and I have this because this is the mess. This is the scripture that I feel like God led me to as I was getting ready for this week. I'm like, that was, that was a God thing. That was, that was like, I, I kind of knew where I felt like God was saying this, this mess, clarity, that we need clarity. We, we need to see clearly what God wants to do in us and we need to see him, clear, see him clearly, see what discipleship is clearly. What we need to stop walking in blindness. And what I'm hoping is, is that as we walk through this one word that you have this morning, as we, we're going to dedicate that here in a few moments, as we, we kind of take time to write in our notebooks and say, all right, God, what do you want to say to us? As we spend time in God's word through Know Your Bible whether, or some reading plan, that we get clarity. We, we, get, we get to see not just shapes, but we see clearly what God wants to do in our life. So what we're going to ask you to do is I'm going to have the worship team come up, um, and I'm going to pray. And uh, if you know what your one word is, um, we have four different places. You can probably spread the paper out and the Sharpies. Write, write the word down and just put it on the stage on, on the ground there someplace. And, and this is just a way of saying, um, really, to Jesus, saying, Jesus, this is, this is what you've led me to, and now I give it to you. Do a work through this one word in my life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> this miracle is, is so central to the book of Mark about seeing clearly. And so God, I pray, I pray that you bring clarity to our life about how we see you. Help us not to see this as real religion or see this as just a place to go, that we, we see the person of you, of, of Jesus, of, of this relationship that we can have. I pray that you give us a clear picture of discipleship, of what it means to follow you. God, uh, help us give a, a clear picture of what it, uh, how you provide, how you take care of us. God, just remove the veil from our eyes. In Jesus' name, amen.